Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Literary Lessons Podcast 2 for 1 episodes, where we look at two films and discuss the themes of the month with your special co host Vicky Ray, John Wilson, and Keith Shago, coming at you from the UK and USA. Welcome to the Literary License Podcast, and today we're doing The Lodger, the 1944 classic, and Time After Hot Time from 1979. And today we have with us Vicki Ray. Hello, Vicki. Hi, everybody. And John Wilson. Hello, folks. And before we get started, let's talk about our roses and thorns of the week. So, John, what's your rose and thorn of the week? Um, I would say my thorn of the week is just me trying to not lose my brain and living in a, a, a studio apartment. So for all of those <laughs> of you who are out there right now struggling with this, you know, staying at home, it's very important to, you know, make sure you give yourself time to maybe just step out. You don't have to step out and talk to anyone, but step out outside and get a little, you know, air, fresh air, and it's then return back to your your box that you live in <laughs> um and then from the roses um i'm going to talk about actually a show that i watched it was on um cbs all access which I actually it's free for a month right now so if anyone is interested um it's why women kill it's a mark cherry show very much like desperate housewives so if anyone ever saw desperate housewives i've seen that actually Absolutely. is that the one that has like three different stories yeah so it parallels three different uh stories in three different time periods yeah, and it's all that, set actually. in one house um in the 60s 80s and in current times and it's really really good it has lucy Liu. it has yeah, um i've, I've watched that actually. it has the the uh oh my god why, why am i playing jennifer goodwin from once upon a time um really really good i think probably the most boring part of the story is actually the current times because you'll find the 60s is very interesting about the 60s housewife and she finds out her husband's cheating on her and so what do you do and sounds like vintage 60s to me it is it's like her and her her literally like her her dress and she's like the housewife who comes in and her you know the husband comes home and she gives him a, a a, you know a cocktail and here you are honey and she's like that type of a housewife um, it would not have lasted long in that it, era but it takes an <laughs> it takes an interesting turn and then the yeah. same thing with the 80s is like lucy Liu is like the she's a provider she's the one who has a lot of money and her husband and her own like a gallery but then she finds out her husband's gay and so she's like oh my god what are, you know it's her third marriage a very different progressive woman you know and then the modern is a couple who is in a open relationship. So they each can do their own thing, but they're married. And, and it's what happens when the, the wife actually brings one of her, her tricks home to be there. So it's a very interesting story. Really well done. Like the way it's set up and the way it's actually filmed is very interesting because they have to flip between all of the different time periods and how they do that is very um it's very like cinematic and and it's just yeah i i love it and again it's mark cherry so i think it was the original concept he pitched to abc and they didn't like it and then he was like well i have this other idea called desperate housewives and they loved that idea so they ended up and that one flew 
and that one flew. And I think that actually ran longer than it should have. But um, the interesting thing about this is that once a season ends, it kind of wraps up the story of all these three different time periods and they're going to do a new season and it can now have three different time periods and three different stories and all that. So right. It's very interesting. And what about yourself, Vicki? What are your roses and thorns? Oh, I don't have too many roses and thorns this week. Um, I would say I'm probably with John kind of getting tired of being, you know, self-isolating and kind of missing going out and doing stuff and missing the gym, missing just going out and seeing people. I but hear I mean, violence. It is, it is what it is. So. <laughs> He's so not nice to me. <laughs> but um, I don't miss you either. Now, my daughter was talking about she's trying to still finagle ways to get us to London in a month. I honestly don't see it happening. So well, we're, planes are still flying into London. I don't know what's happening when they're here, but we're still yeah, getting people coming allowed, through every day. I we're allowed to go back and forth just for like, you know, pleasure kind of thing. Yeah. But that's kind of my thorn. We've been looking forward to this for months, you know. We saved up money and we were just, you know, wanting to go do Stonehenge June 21st, do this summer solstice and all that other cool shit. But yeah, we'll see what happens. You know, the, the only thing I got to say is I just hope that everybody I care and love about, you know, I just take care of yourself. That's all you can do right now. It's going to, it's going to pass like a kidney stone, but I think yeah. we're going to get through this. Yeah. It just takes yeah. us all doing it together. Yeah. It, it, we really are in this lifeboat together right now. I mean, there's just no getting around it. We're all in the same boat. And I'm going to push some of those people out of life. Though. I know. You would. <laughs> is this going to be now? Is this going to be like literally like the movie in the life boat we discussed? <laughs> yeah. I one of those situations. Hey, Keith's the humanitarian. We all know that. What, and what's your... Keith? what about you, Keith? What is... My thorn is stupid people. I'm just sick of dealing with them on a day-to-day basis. Um, people are not using common sense and they're not being conscientious and they're not doing risk assessments when they go outside for themselves. They just want someone to give them all the answers. And I'm just, I'm just over it. So I don't think there are any. If any of my patients are out there listening to you, to me, um, I'm talking about you. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's, I mean, I don't really have too much thorn. I'm just at the moment, I kind of like, Every day just kind of washes into each other at the moment for me. So in you know, the 12 to 18 hour days are, you know, probably lack of sleep is probably my thorn. Right. I probably could use more sleep. Hard but to it's, believe it's Easter weekend even, you know. I know. Well, no one's to be going honest, to church. We're not they, doing they, they kind of canceled the bank holidays here at the moment. So I had the next four days off, so, which is good, even though I'm on Oh, wow. On you call. finally got some time off. Thank you. Well, well, I'm on call at the moment, so but I'm last resort call. So unless things go, unless a nuclear holocaust happens, I shouldn't be called in. So, so we should be fine there. And my rose is the fourth season of Money Heist or Casa de Papel, as it's known in Spain. Fantastic series. You should really watch it. Um, it's actually the number two watch show around the world of all times. It beat what out is Game it? of Thrones. It beat out, um, it's called M- Money Heist. It's a Spanish I've never even heard of this. I've never even heard of this. It's on Netflix. Um, and so far, um, it's a, I think it has um, over 150 million people who have watched it wow. around the world. I'm glad it beat out Game of Thrones. That's probably pretty fantastic then. That well, I think, I think what you, it's one of those shows that you watch. And then the thing is, is that I think, you know, the first two, and they were able to come back for two more seasons and they're doing a really good job. But I think what you like about it, it's just, there is, it's about a, um, a bank heist. And you kind of watch it and then the reasoning for the bank heist and it just keeps changing and chopping. It's a drama, but it's action and it just has so much going for it. Everything's just so complex. And it's like this great big puzzle box that's being worked out in front of you. And, and you think just when you think you have it, it you got something totally else. And it, I, you know, watch it. I think it deserves everything. It, it did win, it did win an Emmy. So it has won Emmys and stuff like this. It's winning awards all over the place. And we're in the fourth season now. Each season's about 10 wow. episodes. So yeah. that's fantastic. And 
Anything else? But yeah, I'm just watching a lot of crap television at the moment. Ink Master, we all watching are. that because I like that. Real Housewives in New York City's back, so we're watching that. I actually have to watch the finale for Modern Family. I have it on my DVR. I just remembered, but um, I, didn't I heard watch it was really it yet, good. But it looked I, really good. Yeah, I heard that was good. But he, one of uh, so the network was actually saying that the documentary is actually much more heartfelt like not that the finale isn't important because it's like two parts but the documentary they do after and talk about them is what's more like you start crying more than that because it's like the years they've gotten to know each other they become they were a family for 11 12 years i mean right they literally got to see all these kids grow up and like so that's kind of amazing oh we got to see them grow up as well yeah, yeah. i mean look at lily yeah. i know I mean, well lily I and lily and the, i mean all of them you look yeah. at the the one the the um what's the son of the the dumpies i mean he went from yeah. this and like now he's a man you know? I know i think it was just time for that show yeah i actually do i think it really hit a lot of people yeah and i, yeah. I, I thought it was great I mean, it's 12 years was it yeah it's like 12 years i mean it, it also like, seasons how, isn't you it? can keep going and keep going but i feel like there is um time to cut out with respect yeah. It's yeah. it's just respectful, you know. It's like respectful to them. It's respectful to the characters and and you know the nuances of the writing is always was always brilliant to me and really mm-hmm. funny. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were, they were able to keep your interest to be like, oh, what's going to happen now, and how is this family going to evolve now, and you know, yeah. like the I mean, they, dead, right? they were getting in the last 11, couple seasons. Like, well, the last couple seasons they they kind of were starting to repeat storylines slightly as well. So I think yeah. when you get to the point where you're starting to repeat your storylines, it's probably time to say goodbye. Otherwise, they're like yeah. a soap opera with the baby theme. It's like stop. Well, so also you don't know what to do with some of the characters. Like the mom was always like career, non-career, and now a different career. And so she was very career oriented, but it was always like well why do we need to keep focusing on her they can kind of shift and so they kind of did with Sofia Vergara like character like she was always an at-home mom and was like now her now that her other child is growing up it's like well I want a career and so she kind of gets involved in real estate so that was like a different funny little segment yeah. inside you know but like how much of that can you have right so now what is going to be this dad and now is going to be this like so and I think once you can get to the point where you're actually you can pre, you pretty much can already prejudge what exactly is going to happen in an episode because you know the characters yeah. so well as well. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Well, it'll we'll be missed. So. You know. Yeah. Uh, it was a great series, though. I mean, it, it definitely was. We were ready for it. I mean. Yeah. I it was heartfelt. It, it was funny too. I mean. They could always, yeah. if they wanted to, down the road, they can do Modern Families and have it split off and be about the other kids and not you know like you could always do that too and make it about each one of their households or they can definitely though i don't think those spinoffs really do well no it's hard because you also are breaking up the ensemble and you're actually making other you're adding in other elements that are just not part of the norm so yeah but then again you're whenever you have kids in a program the problem your the problem is always going to be is how do you keep these kids at home after a certain point of time as well yeah. Keep them so that yeah. way they're still part of or the Or keep them from program. aging. Yeah. Well, I mean, you had a you know, you have it with every single teenage program. You know, Riverdale, they're going to college, so how are they gonna break how are they gonna do that? It's like how I know we, that's that's how, gonna how be how that, do we ensure Buffy had the same problem where, you know, all of a sudden it's like all of a sudden everyone's going to a local community college because or yeah. you have or you do have them move away. Yeah, I love Riverdale too. So. Please don't tell me that's and, gonna end. well. I also think it's interesting because, like, how many of them have that much time to hang out together? Because you're kind of like, do you have jobs? Because, like, I know me, I'm like eight yeah. ten hours a day at a job. How many? How do you all have time to hang out with one another? And that that's where it becomes a little bit like. Yeah, but you have that with, I'm you have that with any something. show that has kids in it, though. You have it yeah. every show. I was kind of hoping they do something with Josie and the Pussycats. Really, I would love to see that. Well, they're they are doing. Um, Katie Kane. Oh, they are. Yeah, Katie Kane is on CW. It's actually coming to CW. I, I don't right I hardly ever watch CW. Yeah. I always wait for things to get on Netflix yeah. or Amazon. So it's on Katie Kane is actually going to be on CW. I don't know how it's going to actually do because it seems a little off. It seems a little like Sex in the City. It's not it yeah. like eh, I don't know how it's going to do. I I think it's also not what's not faring well as as well as Nancy Drew because they're trying to do like a supernatural feel for Nancy Drew. Right. But it's just not. I don't think it's panning well. You can't top well, that's supernatural. That's probably because, it's probably because of Sabrina though, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's like, a wannabe Sabrina. Doing really but well. without let's get let's, that last yeah. that last season of Sabrina though. That was really good. 
Yeah. That was excellent. I don't know if you guys watched it, but I loved it. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. Fantastic. I finished Fox and Sabrina, yeah. yeah. So, I guess on that note, let's talk about The Lodger, the 1944 film. But before we talk about The Lodger, we have Story Geeks with us to give us their special What You Need to Watch During Your Isolation for this week and what's free to download. So, take it away, Story Geeks. What movies and TV shows should you be watching this week? I'm Jay Shear, co-host of the Story Geeks podcast, and here are the movies and TV shows you can watch from home. Just released and available to rent or buy this week, Cats, one of the most made fun of movies of 2019. And now you can buy it. Based off the Broadway show of the same name, it has a bunch of famous entertainers in it, and they're all playing Cats. It also only has a 32 on Metacritic. Ouch. Cats is rated PG. Doolittle, about Dr. Doolittle and starring Robert Downey Jr. interacting with a bunch of animals, is rated PG. Might be good for the whole family, but it only has a Metacritic rating of 26. The critics are not into the animal movies this week. But one movie they are into is Little Women, one of my wife's favorite films from 2019. Little Women has a Metacritic score of 91 and is rated PG. Lots of PG movies this week. Also new to Netflix, Community, the sitcom, which a bunch of my friends have recommended to me. And Netflix has just released a bunch of Studio Ghibli, the Japanese animation studio movies. I've heard really good things about that studio and their movies as well. So some good stuff coming to Netflix. As for my pick of the week, if you're looking to escape thinking about the pandemic, definitely check out Community. If you want something with a little more heart, check out Pixar's Onward, which is phenomenal, and on Disney Plus right now for free, or check out Little Women. Our latest The Story Geeks podcast is all about Disney Animation's Frozen series. We break down the two highest earning Disney animated movies of all time in an attempt to understand what makes people resonate with Anna and Elsa. Check out The Story Geeks podcast on your preferred podcast provider. Until next week, this has been Jay Shear from the Story Geeks, and I hope you have fun streaming movies and TV shows from home. Hello, welcome back, and thank you, Story Geeks, for letting us know what we can watch during this COVID times and what we can watch during our isolation. So this brings us to The Lodgers, a 1944 horror film about Jack the Ripper, based on the novel of the same name by Marie Belloc. Landos. It stars Merle Oberon, George Saunders, and Larry Krager, featuring Sir Cedric Wardwick, and was directed by John Brom from a screenplay by Bear Linden. London's story has previously been filmed in 1927 as the silent film The Lodger, A Story of the London Fog, which was directed by Alfred Hitchcock, and with sound in 1932 as The Lodger. It was remade again in 1953 as The Man in the Attic, starring Jack Palance, and again in 2009 by David Adejanche. And I'm I sure I just massacred the name. Adejanche. <laughs> so what we're going to do is going to cut to the trailer of The Lodger, and we'll be right back. Inspector? Oh, some poor chap beat his sweetheart to death with this. Why did he do it? Well, we've never known exactly, but my belief at this moment is that she failed to answer some perfectly simple question. In that case, Inspector, I'll come to tea on Friday. Thank you, Miss Langley. Does anybody know why he commits these murders? The Ripper must have a motive, but no man alive can even guess at what it might be. And the women who could know are dead. Yours is a beauty which could destroy me. Is that a compliment? Or it could destroy you. Have you thought of that? That's a very queer thing to say, and besides, I don't think I'm beautiful at all. 
I uh, take a great deal of trouble to give that impression, though. It is one thing if a woman is beautiful merely for herself. But when she exhibits the loveliness of her body upon the stage... Hello, welcome back to the Literary License Podcast, and we're discussing The Lodger, the 1944 film. So, Vicky, this was your choice. We'll start with you. What are your thoughts on the 1944 film Scott. Lodger? Well, we I remember, again? I know we always <laughs> talk about monster movie matinee all the time, but mm-hmm. that's where I saw it for the first time. It was like one of my mother's favorite movies, and I hadn't really thought of it much until we discussed, you know, what we were going to do, you know, this coming season. And I, I just thought that, well, you know me, I like the silver screen stuff. And I thought it was beautifully filmed. Cinematically, it was, you know, like the lighting and everything. It was just, just a beautiful film. And uh, the uh, bad guy, who was the bad guy? George Sanders. Yeah. He played... Um, uh, L- he played... Krieger. Was it? Yeah, Krieger. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, Krieger, he, was, he was the Ripper. The, he was the And they always had his eyes Mr. shown... Slade. Yes, Mr. Slade. And they showed his, they always had his eyes like with this penned in lighting. Yeah. And I don't know if they darkened him, you know, around his no, eyes. No, that was a very noir thing. It was actually lighting. It was, it was lighting they would use to kind of silhouette the eyes because the focus of right. the eyes is where but the windows see the soul. they did it so well and it just kind of grabbed you, you know, the, the, the film just kind of jumps out at you. I mean, uh, Scott watched it with me and, you know, he was kind of transfixed. So we, we sat there and I watched it twice again. And uh, I, I just can't say enough for silver screen. It, it just does something for you. Other, than, I, I know that we got all this, you know, cool stuff now and where we have uh, special effects and everything, but some things you just can't replace. And it's one of these kind of movies. I don't know what y'all thought about it yet, but I, th- I, I thought it. it was what I was quite drawn to the film is, is I like the way that it was lit. And the thing is, you normally when you see whether it's a black or white or a color, whatever like this, right. and it's done in Victorian times, you kind of, and it's kind of br- brightly lit, and you yeah. kind of thinking, well. And the thing is, this looked like it was actually lit from the gas lamps that they were using. Yeah, and, correct. And I thought that was quite film. impressive. Yeah. Well, I don't mean it was dark, but I mean it was dark. Yeah. You know, the energy was really dark about it. Of course, it would be because it's Jack the Ripper. You know, White Chapel yeah. murders and all that. And I mean. No, I was going to say, and I think it's hard to do that sometimes when you are trying to film a piece where it's either overly lit or it's too dark, right? So then you're like, you can't even see the characters in in it. But in order for you to kind of capture the like scenes of the London fog, right? Of the characters going down the streets and going, and it was to me, like, like he said, it almost felt like you were, you were in the film in the sense with the lighting because it was, how how would you capture a scene like this where someone goes down an alley and it's still dark, but it's not too dark that you can't see them. And it's like, you feel like, oh, it's the, it's the lamp. So you can actually see the lamp lighting and the way it was shot and the way the camera follows the hands and going down, like the first scene where, you know, she's pulling her skirt up, you know, and whatever. It's like right. one of those things where it's like, oh, I might be mixing this up with the other one. But it's like that scene, you know, the capturing of the, of, the attack is like so well done because it it kind of like goes to when you look at other horror films they clearly took notice from this to not see the killer right away and how you see it's from the victims they're like jaws you don't want to see the shark first it's like the victim's perspective though right you're not seeing who the killer is you're just seeing the conversation that the the victim's having with the killer and they like how that is how how it influenced other filmmakers in in the future. Well, yeah. on top of that, if you remember Merle Oberon, she's like carrying this candle through yeah. the, you know, the hallway and it's kind of lighting everything up. You can see her holding the candle, trying to cup it with her hand. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm pretty sure they had lighting at that point for the film, but it was just well done. I mean, yeah. 
I mean, I, I don't know much of John Bram's work, the guy who directed this, but I mean, I don't see why he is not a bigger name than what he is. I mean, you know, there, there are certain things I noticed that he uses, like um, with Slade, when he comes into the room, and you know how, like, he's always set himself apart, and he's yeah. in the room, and basically he's talking about, he's got all the pictures turned around. And right. Sort of and he's like in the corner. So this guy's like, and it, they always made sure he looked like he was being isolated. He's isolated himself away from everyone. There's, and he did that like in every single scene that he's got in. But you notice how he towers yeah. over everybody? They made sure that the camera angle, he, well, he was probably a tall man. Yeah. yeah. But he was I six, mean, he he, he's actually six foot five. Wow. He, so he's definitely everybody. a tall man. <laughs> yeah. He's a very tall man. But I so, mean, clearly how they filmed it, that he, he's always like Merle Oberon. She's probably a petite little thing. So. The interesting thing is, is that, here's a little tidbit, is that the murder at the very beginning, what they, um, when the, the only, when they got, a, they got away with a lot. I mean, they do get away with this homosexual undertone and this incest undertone that's going on throughout the film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and Warner let them get away, you know, in love with this film. The only change that he made is the murder in the beginning. And that murder in the beginning was actually after do you know, remember the woman who comes to the stage door and, um, and the flowers arrive for the yes. Right. Yes. character mm-hmm. and the woman's, and then she gives money to the woman. The next scene was her going out being killed. That scene is now the beginning of the movie. So that woman you're seeing twice. But, and what they did was, that the only thing they did I was, didn't notice that. Wow. I, I didn't either. They did a redubbing and gave her a different name. Oh, how interesting. I didn't realize that was I didn't her. realize that either. Which yeah, also yeah, makes that a little bit more sadder to see that it. that's where she ends up being more like, kind of like a prostitute in a way. Like she's like, yeah. you know, well, it's they like did she kind of deflect from it. that too because yeah. we know that he really targeted ladies of the night. I yeah, guess. yeah, but yeah. They couldn't use the word prostitute because of the Hayes Code, so yeah. they made her a, a showgirl. A showgirl, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is just like a prostitute. Can, can. <laughs> which, which you know, can we just say, you know, Kitty, Kitty is beautiful stunning as a woman but how in the hell do you not see <laughs> the psychoticness of someone like this because it just yeah. it, the mannerisms i have to say he just in general he played a really creepy man like mm. he played just someone that was though held his distance from people when he was alone with someone it was like encroaching on their space mm. like he was ev- invading their space and there was something so intense, turn. wasn't it? Yeah, it's just intense. Well, like when he came into her bedroom when she was alone yes. in the house, they didn't want to leave her alone in the house. And he was talking about how beauty always, you know, kills whatever. And you got to cut Sometimes you have to kill the beauty, out. you have to cut it out, you know, and you're like, what? <laughs> I mean, how did she not know this guy was kind of a psycho? I mean, I, was, I, 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 I can't figure out, I can't, I can't out. figure out how, how come this guy was single. Yeah. <laughs> Really? <laughs> Such a catch. Okay, I mean, well, God. You have to exasperate <laughs> now. Well, I mean, and to top it all off, I mean, the thing is, is like, you know, the, and I love, I love the mother, or not the mother, but the, I, the, I guess she, the, uh, the, the she's landlady. She's the aunt, right? but yeah. the landlady. Yeah. And, you know, and she, she goes in and talks to him, and he's like, and then he, t- and then he does this story about, the beautifulness of his brother and how beautiful he is and the beautiful eyes and yeah. how, you know, and how he loves him. Like, you know, like he's never loved another person. And, and you're thinking, and you know, the woman's <laughs> like, Oh, well, you know, the person's a good artist, you know, yeah. sort of thing. But you think it's right. like, God is like, he's actually talking about actually like being, in love with your brother not just he doesn't love his brother he loves his brother yeah, he that's loves true, <laughs> like, <I'll, laughs> love. that's true that that's why he was so angry with women though because wasn't well it never it never explains him, that i mean it explains that his brother was well an artist it, and that it, he could capture this beauty and like he was capable he was and he so, was beautiful himself and, and he was you know how, i mean it does explain that the brother died in some ways. Either he killed himself, killed himself. I'm or assuming over someone. over a woman who ruined yeah. him, a beautiful yeah. woman who ruined him. So yes. I think it does kind of explain that a little bit. But it's a uh, yeah, it's a very talented Ripley type of situation. But it but just happens to be brother. to throw in a homosexual, you know, Undertone. love for your family for your brother is. I mean, I, I mean, I, I didn't see that. Okay, I mean, I well, can't. that's totally dysfunctional. And I wasn't going there. I didn't think that. I just thought he was obsessed with his brother. No, but, so, no, because the thing is, is that when I was, I was actually, there's a, I bought the Blu-ray of this because 
it was actually cheaper than because I couldn't find it Renting. anywhere when I was winning it. And I, so I was looking on eBay and stuff like this. And I go, oh, there's a Blu-ray. Well, that's fine. I quite like the silent film. I've seen, I got the, the, the silent film on Blu-ray. It's like, okay, well, it's worth it. It was six quid. Why not? Right. And there's a really good documentary. Also, the radio, um, Vincent Price, who's a good friend of um, Krieger's, um, did, is, does the radio play of it as well, which is quite interesting. It's on the disc as well. Well, I was going to mention, doesn't he sound like him? His voice sounds they like were really good. They were really good friends. Um, Krieger died two years after this film was made. Um, he, wow. What happened is he started losing weight. He started losing weight for this film because he's quite a big man and they needed another film. And because of complications due to his weight loss, he died. And Vincent Price actually did the eulogy for him at his wow. funeral. No way. But Didn't they have, have the that. similar voices because I remember when he first started talking, the scene when he first meets um, Ellen, the, the border, I was like, I was doing something and then I heard his voice and I turned around. And I was like, wait, is this Vincent Price? And then I was like, no, but he sounds a lot like Vincent Price. Like, yeah. Well, they had that same kind of acting style as well. I yeah. noticed, you know, the, 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 I mean, this, the, what's, um, Laird Krager or Slade, I have to sit there and say, he's a fantastic actor. Yeah, absolutely. He, I mean, the thing is, he, you know, he kind of frightens you. You're intimidated by him, but you can't stop watching him. Yeah. And to be honest, I think he kind of steals the, I mean, even though George Saunders is the bigger name, he kind of steals the movie away from George Saunders. Yeah. And everyone else, actually. And I like the way that basically you have a monster movie who's a human. Basically, you have this human who's a monster. But you actually, I like how that you actually, you do feel, he, he is a sad character, though. I mean, I didn't yeah. find, like, even Tragic. when he dies, you kind of feel bad that he dies. Which is kind of weird, because you, you, seem, you know that he, well, you're assuming that he's murdering, because the thing, they don't really, you know... When I was first watching the film, I thought basically that maybe George Saunders was the murderer and pinning things on him because he was the most likely candidate. Correct. And I thought this was going to be a mystery. I thought like, oh, it's who you think you think it is. And it was actually, I thought he was a detective because he said, I'm, I'm working, right? Yeah. I'm doing it. And I thought maybe he is, maybe it's making it seem like he's the killer, but he's actually the detective hunting down the killer. Yeah. So I expected it to be a twist and there's no yeah. twist. And I think that's what's brilliant about this film is that there's no twist yeah you, you know, get what you get because yeah. you know you know the, the twist is basically that george saunders is not the murderer because because you get that point one scene with merle oberon and george saunders and he's like you know this you know this is from the murderer in tufno park and this is you know this woman who murdered her husband with poison he like in that murder room and these are the death masks of, of the murderers and you're kind of watching this going okay it's kind of, so i thought oh they're setting this up for something you know that and then, and then it kind of, then when at the end, he's like, okay. But then you realize it's like, no, actually, he's the lodger. Uh, yeah. Slate is the murderer. And that, I thought that was most surprising because I, I did expect a twist for some reason. I think that it does well, though, because think of all the mystery that shrouds Jack the Ripper. I mean, do we actually know who he was? I mean, you just got all these theories out there and whatnot. Was I was, I was actually going to bring that up because I was like, you know, we had this we've explored many things like Amityville and, you know, other, other cases of things that have happened where there's so much um, intrigue around this, this figure that was a historical infamous figure. Right. And how just looking at this film, how like you admit, had mentioned that it was originally a Hitchcock film and then it went from a Hitchcock film to this. And then they did a remake of a man in the attic and then they did another remake. So there's so many stories, layers upon layers of this one figure. Right. And how it's been sort of, everybody wants to know who he was. Yeah. I mean, and, and no one, no one knows, you know, know, I mean, we got theories, but we really honestly don't know who he was except well, that we know he had surgical skill apparently. Yeah. Well, the Jack the Ripper th story is kind of weird because, to be honest, it wasn't the f first kind of murders of that kind. There have been other murders before that time. Correct. But I, I yeah. think I think Jack, I think what makes Jack the Ripper intriguing, I think from what I know, is that it was the first media sensation of the serial killer. Yeah. Basically, it's like the 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 media was kind of like today, where the media is kind of like just spreading it and spreading it and spreading it. So therefore, so therefore, it's now part of our imaginations. Yeah. And so. But it seems weird that, you know, Dr. Brady killed, what, four women? 
I think so. It was like four or five. Yeah. I think he killed more than that. No, it was like four or five. It wasn't, wasn't that it? many. It was just the brutality of the killing. So like one brutality. of the one of the room was like the entire room was covered in blood. So yeah. it was like literally how much he hacked the woman up, you know. So that yeah, it was and more. And he's kind of like playing with her insides as well, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, I know. Like well, well, he did remove, I guess, the uterus and the ovaries and laid them right next to the victim because yeah. he obviously knew what he was about the other had yeah. probably and the thing is the the women were i mean which is what's kind of strange here think he is, had mommy and this is, or mommy issues or he well the he the, in this movie he had mommy issues because you know the women, the women were all older in this yeah. in this film the, the victims is i don't know how old the real thing is i mean there's been quite a few jack the rippers and some of them are some of the jack, jack the ripper movies that you kind of see they kind of like fudge things I mean, we had From Hell with Johnny Depp. Yeah. That kind right. of like, it was like a comic book version of it that they've made to screen. And it, and they made everyone a bit young. And then you have other Jack the Rippers where they have them a bit older. And then you read the stories and it's like, and the thing is you have, have to remember it's Victorian times. So if they're in their 30s and 40s, that's probably old in those times. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. you know, so it's kind of really hard to judge what kind of... um. There's also like a religious undertone too, especially like when he sees the Bible in the the woman's, which I love how she's like, oh, you want it? And I'm like, really? (laughs) It's like your family Bible. You're like, here, take it. You know? Yeah, I know. (laughs) What the hell? Well, to be honest, you know, that's one book you don't want to carry back and forth in the two. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, (laughs) But there was that religious undertone too about why I never think he looked at the border because she was so morally sound, right? Versus... When he, when even the maid, he kind of gave a side look, like, oh, uh, you know. And, and well, he it. liked the maid, though. He was. He happy. did, but I mean, I think it took a little bit of like, oh, I can trust you. Versus, I mean, Kitty, he was like, you're a harlot, right? And he just was fixated on her, you know. Well, I mean, the way that she was dressed when she performed, I mean, that's got to be quite racy for Victorian well, times. Then, to be showing your legs, can, yeah. Oh, and then doing the little peekaboo, yeah, a little yeah. You know, I mean, because she did, she did music halls, and the music hall is basically like burlesque. Just, yeah. You know, that's the Victorian version of burlesque, really. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so I guess she would be kind of like the um, like a painted lady per se. You know, in those days. And I, I like the trickery though too, because he wants so badly to like her, in, end her, but then he likes her. Like there's something he is trying to fight liking her because he sees that she's not oh, I'm so beautiful. Uh, everyone wants to be me. She's very modest about her beauty and about who she is. And it's just, you know, she's not someone who is about her vanity. Though, you know, you could say yes and no because the fans that come to her and the people that are in awe of her, every time she comes into a room, everyone looks at her. So you can also say she, yes, she doesn't do that, but yes, she does. Like she's And that clear- was not Merle Oberon's voice. That was somebody that dubbed it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sing that well. Do you know the funny thing? I did some research on Merle Oberon because um, over here there's a scandal about her, and that had to be that she was mixed race. Oh, but okay. I thought that was a scandal. The actual scandal is, is that her sister, who was 12 years older f- than her, was actually gave birth to her when she was 12. She's what? Her mother was 12 years again? old. <laughs> uh, basically, her older sister, who she thought was her older sister, was actually her mother. And she was 12 oh, years no older. So wow. she gave birth to Oberon when she was 12 years old. Wow. So that's like, oh 12. my God. Oh, geez. 12. That's, that's and even cool. after, um, then what happened is, is what's quite interesting about Merle Oberon. She's done some fantastic films, which I believe that we're going to be covering one, another film of hers next season with um, Wuthering Heights. Which she did like Wuthering Heights. And she's a really, I love she's a really well-respected too. actress. But even after she had a plan, uh, she got in a car accident, which ruined her face. And she right. said, you'll never work again. And she said, you watch me. And she worked to the day she died. And she died wow. in the, to the 70s, you know, sort of things. She I always thought she was beautiful, though. She had some kind of dignity and grace about her that you just, yeah. you just don't see too much, you know, after this, except for Betty Davis and whatnot. But yeah. they just don't make them like that anymore. That's my dad would say. Mm-hmm. I have to there say, though, I think... Um, this is apparently 1944. This was the the most um, highly rated and biggest box office horror film for the 40s. This film is. Yeah. It was kind of intense for back in the day, don't you think? I mean, it made yeah. it made 13 million, which is a lot for about you know, that's a lot. <laughs> well, I'm a bit surprised that this has kind of gotten lost a little yeah. bit. 
Because if Vicky didn't mention this, I, I mean, okay, I, I knew, I collect all Alfred Hitchcock films. I have all his silent films and stuff like that upstairs. So I knew The Lodger. I didn't, you know, I knew his version of it. I didn't realize it was remade or anything like that. And if Vicky didn't mention it, mention this or put this on the list i don't think i've ever would have come across it which is kind of sad because this is actually movie gold really yeah. i can't find anything bad to say about this film every single shot is fantastic as we said what vicky said also is that it's fantastically shot good script that yeah. no one no one's dumbed down whatsoever everyone every i mean this is one of those few films that everyone even the people who are working on the stage door has a chance to shine yeah and it's also and it's everything you see a film that everyone shines and ever everything makes sense in it it's not long meandering conversations it's literally like the one of my favorite scenes is when the detective is actually talking to um the border's husband and how he's explaining well maybe we were wrong about the fingerprints and like talking about the logic of the fingerprints oh where they went and got the glass and they realized but then like how he's like but we always thought he was doing it from behind but what if he was actually doing from the front and he was right hand like so he breaks down the logic and so that scene is filled still with this intrepidation because you're watching now um, Slade upstairs, <clears throat> like trying to get ready, trying to get leave, and then the maid's coming in, and she—I guess the maid was coming back to get the husband, I think. But like how they scare her, it's like so that whole scene was such a great scene, but it all makes sense. It's well, not I like the grandma or mom or whatever she is, aunt. She brings up his drink because he likes to have a lemon tonic or something. Yeah, yeah, night. yeah. And so she brings it up so that he, you know, can handle the glass and whatnot. But I thought that was kind of funny because I thought she was gonna like freak out. And not be so well reserved, you know. Yeah. Could you imagine? You know, it's Jack the Ripper, and you're trying to keep your composure. But I feel like she yeah. always was defending him because she was always like, "But he's a good man. He's a gentleman." And you're like, "Who burns things in the middle of the night? Who literally?" Oh yeah, he burns his bag. That would have been a dead giveaway, don't you think? He yeah, it's just yeah. to burn his bag. Yeah. The funny thing about this film as well that it is, but it's all ambiguous. Is he Jack the Ripper? Yeah. Because the thing is, you because the thing is, when when you ever see a murder, and then and then it cuts to him doing some, some being somewhere else and doing something else. So you don't actually see him running around, well, running away. We assume that he's Jack the Ripper. We're led to believe that, but yeah. even after he dies, we're not. We're, you're, you're never quite sure because okay, he, he has a knife, but it's like, but it's not the scalpel that that we're being right. used before. It's a different knife. Yeah. So, which is quite interesting that I like the, I like the ambiguity. So if you look at it, it's like, oh my God, that's okay. He's the Jack the Ripper. Or you can look at it. And I think this is what makes it quite clever. You can look at it as like, well, is he Jack the Ripper? They think he is, yeah. but let's face it. You know, people go after, you know, the wrong person just because, you know, they're focused. And right. was George Sanders going after him because he thought he was Jack the Ripper or was he going after him because he was jealous because he wanted to be with Merle Oberon's character? Yeah. And, been, and and she and Merle Oberon's character wasn't that into George Saunders, but was paying a bit more attention to Slade. So maybe you know, so it could have been played that way. He was well. rather intrigued by him. You have to admit, because <laughs> she probably didn't understand why she couldn't rope this one in. Yeah, yeah. I would. I would also say it would have been interesting if he was wasn't, and that the Jack the Ripper was actually his brother. It would have been interesting yeah. to have that scenario, like a, a woman well, ruined is, him, and he loved his possible. brother so much, and he was actually. Imagine you're hunting your brother in a way to like stop him from doing. Oh, you think he's like picking up the gauntlet? Yeah, or trying to protect the brother too, because like burning this stuff would have been like, oh, let me if I burn the evidence, like he can't go to jail, so I have to protect him. And well, he could have opened the kitchen window anyway. (laughs) He's burning shit. That was that was hysterical. (laughs) Smoking everybody out of the house, you know. And she's like, oh, but what about you? And he's like, oh, I'm fine. You're like. <laughs> he did though he kept smoking everybody out of the house it's like open the damn window if you're yeah. gonna burn the evidence yeah well apparently the lodger is known as the best jack the ripper movie ever made really i did yeah. not know that and so i was know. quite surprised that i actually watched the i am um, i think vicky did as well i actually watched the original alfred hitchcock film from 1927 yeah that was actually- and silent film and that's actually based more on the book. Um, the book basically doesn't, t- it's not about Jack the Ripper, it's about a Jack the Ripper-esque type killer called the Avenger. And he leaves a calling card. And, but so, I mean, uh, 
when you tie it in with the the remake, they've kind of done a good job, you know, just just positioning everything. But the relationship between Slade and well, her name is Daisy in the black and white film, right, is a bit more hands on because the lodger is actually quite attractive, right. He's played by Ivor Novello, which the Ivor Novello Award that you hear about oh. based on him. Sort of oh. He's one of, the, like, one of the great actors of all time. And it's quite interesting. What did you think of the, the silent film very shortly, Vicky? Uh, well, I kind of, uh, well, you have to follow the music and you have to follow the writing. So you, it does kind of, do, you have to concentrate on it a little bit more than you would a normal film. But I like the fact that they made her blonde and not the dark haired beauty that Merle Oberon was mm. and you know how she you know she tries to deal with him and she brings him his brandy and everything and he's got the handcuffs and the cloak you know what I mean mm-hmm. did you watch it John no I didn't see it I actually want to now see it because when you mentioned that um and it's also said now it was also put to sound to nine in 1932 or wait no this is 1927 oh it's okay 1927 okay yeah, yeah. it was one of Alfred Hitchcock's first film and I didn't even know it was Alfred Hitchcock because you know me and my well middle-aged mind I didn't even know Alfred Hitchcock was making movies in 1927 yeah. Yeah. So he, I felt kind of or, si- or silent pictures too because you would think oh it's yeah. That. Yeah. but he made I mean, six silent he made six silent films but it's okay. it, it, Definitely, it's definitely Alfred Hitchcock. He's got a signature stamp on it. Yeah. You know? It definitely does. And he, he gets away with everything. No matter what decade the man is in, he gets away with something phallic. He just mm. does. Yeah, he does. <laughs> I don't know how he does it, but he does. That's his card. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's it's, it's, it's mm. calling card. And that, that was what I thought was kind of intriguing about the movie. And it's kind of a claustrophobic film, too. Did you think? Mm, yeah. It was just, just really closed in and dark. But then again, silent film was, you know, because they didn't have the big epicness that, you know, well, mm. what was that? Uh, Birth of a Nation. That was <laughs> yeah. kind of epic, <laughs> you know? Don't, don't mention that name. We just offended somebody, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> Birth of a Nation. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. That was actually oh. a film, though. Uh, it is, actually. Those was um, what's it? Were the CCB DeMille films? Yeah. They were actually, they're very big in production and very huge. And like, if you know, if you see a thousand people on the screen, there's a thousand people there. A cast of thousands, yeah. Precisely, so. But he did try to make him look like he was innocent in the 1927 film. So you never Mm -hmm. really knew, did he do it? Was he bad? You know how he he, he likes to make his um, men look, the men characters, his main actors, portrayed as men that are on the run that didn't might not actually have done it you know what i mean yeah but it's yeah i i i quite i mean i quite like the i mean silent movies and the thing is i think that you kind of have to kind of you kind of have to wade into them and then kind of let them just wash over you because yeah. i, I you well know, they I, take a, they, they require a little more concentration you know well but, yeah but and because there's the no dialogue movie. i mean trouble with me is okay the trouble with me with silent films is basically is that the music the, and i'm kind of like rocking the music I'm, is I'm, corny it's really corny but i love but i love the way they look they have this they normally they're normally filmed beautifully to look at and they, they cleaned them up and you're kind of watching it and then the, then the acting, of course, because there's no dialogue, is kind of over the top, but it does work. But then it's like the music, and this one's, I mean, the one, the version I saw basically has been all remastered with orchestral sound and stuff like this by a an award, a Grammy Award winner called Ninton Swanby. Basically, he's right. like really renowned, known um, person. And the music's fantastic for the remake. But I find myself that I get watching the um, images, and then, of course, and every once in a while, there's, you know, you get the, I like the makeup. It's so overdone. But the music tends to lull me to sleep. <laughs> That's the problem. That's like wake You're myself like, up. It's like, and I, fall, and I tend to fall asleep and then I'm back to where I was and continue on. And that's the only problem I have with silent films. They tend to lull me to sleep a little bit because the music kind of goes Not off a little bit. Yeah. It was a great know. film, though. If you get a chance to watch it, the 1927 version. I'm definitely going to look into watching it. It really, it's, it's, it's really entertaining. But like I said, you know, with any silent film, you have to pay attention to it more. It's sort yeah. of like subtitles. You just, you know. <clears throat> that's going to say any foreign film the same. But after a while, though, I mean, I used to really. Avoid movies that were subtitled because they used to annoy me. 
but now after a while you kind of figure out how to watch them and yeah. so you, you learn how to watch subtitled films where you can keep up with the action that's going on and you know you just read just like you look you read you look you know but it, it comes second um nature after a while so it's not that bad but you know what i mean a lot of people yeah. don't like them it kind of takes you a while to really like subtitled movies but it's also the pace, pacing right so a really good movie that has subtitles is usually knows how to pace the dialogue between scenes right. where you don't need dialogue and it's more about the what's happening versus what's being said so well, I also think foreign films tend to have a different pacing than American films as well. Correct. Like they yeah. kind of like, they lull you in slowly and then they boom. Where American yeah. films tend to start boom and then... Exactly. Yeah, and yeah. Off, exactly. So. But it was really, it was, it, it was nice complimentary, um, you know, addition to watching The Lodger because <clears throat> I don't know what it is about black and white film, but there's just something about the lighting that I just mm. find beautiful. You know? I agree. Yeah. I think with um, also with black and white, because as you said, you got this fantastic shading and the filming and the lighting. And but then because you're not dealing with a bunch of technical gadgetry, that you also have to have a brilliant script as well. So yeah, you kind of have, and so you normally have like because you got because normally with like black and white films is like you could actually shut off the picture of the lodger and just listen to it, and you could pretty much tell the story is still all there. Right. Yeah. You know. With, I mean. And I, I was gonna say, I, I was gonna say, and uh, Kitty had filters for days. I mean, that girl, she was glowing every time, every scene she was in. Well, she's a beautiful yes. woman. I mean, she just <laughs> filmed so you know, she just she was a fabulous film, you know, yeah. uh, subject. I mean, there was just something about her. She didn't have a perfect nose, no. and she wasn't, you know, she, I wouldn't say she was a perfect female, but there was something about filming her that just made her just beautiful. Yeah. She just put the dark hair and the sparkling eyes. See, in the 1927 film, I believe she was blonde. Yeah, because he, so he was, he was killing it. blonde people, blonde girls, wasn't he? The killer in the, mm -hmm. the original and from the original book as well. So Right. I have not read I the have book, to sit. The only thing that flabbergasts me about The Lodger is that this director, John Brahms, is not a bigger name. Yeah, because correct. Just, yeah. I said before, as we mentioned over and over, this film is so beautifully filmed and there's just so much subtext and the way that he does Slade's eyes, you know, the way that, you know, I know, all that just, sort I of know thing. it's all lighting, but I mean, he, he, he just, it's, it's just like evil incarnate, the way they focus in on the eyes. And he's so grand wall. He's just huge. He's this yeah. small man and he's intimidating. Even, but, you but feel that so actor's cool fantastic now. as well, though. I mean, you know, even like at the end, where it's like, you know, he's being cornered and all of a sudden he's gone from this man of, you know, this quiet man that um, we think is up to no good. We understand that he's up to no good. Um, and then he becomes like this caged animal at mm -hmm. the very end. And, you know, and then as everyone's pulling in, and they're, they're closing in on him and the look on his face and the right. way that's all filmed and the way that, the camera, all of, if you notice when you're watching it, it's all of a sudden like he's almost like taking the set and like squeezed it in. Right. Which is, you know, I mean, this director is fantastic. I mean, I think I would have been interested to see what Alfred Hitchcock thought of this version of it and what he thought of Brahm. There's no mention anywhere. No. But I think that Alfred Hitchcock would have been very pleased. Yeah, I mean, and this guy, I mean, I was looking at his his sort of rap sheet. He had some, you know, a lot of different types of movies. He did a 3D horror film, The Mad Magician, in 1954. No um, kidding. Yeah, he lived a very long, I mean, he lived to be 89, and he retired in Malibu, California, but he was from Germany, so. Well, that I'd explains like the German expressionistic stuff, look to the film, then. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to see some of his other stuff. I bet you'd be pretty interesting to watch. It's called The Man Magician. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to hunt down some of his other films and give those a watch because I was actually very impressed with this. And talking about being very impressed, now we're going to cut to Time After Time, the 1979 film, which is a, an American metro color science fiction film directed by screenwriter Nicholas Meyer and starring Malcolm McDowell, David Warner, and Mary Steenburgen. Filmed in Panavision, it was the directing debut of Meyer, whose screenplay is based on the premise from Carl Al Alexander's novel, Time After Time, which was an unfinished at the time, and a story by Alexander and Steve Hayes. The film presents a story in which British author H.G. Wells uses time machine to pursue Jack the Ripper into the 20th century. 
The title and the idea of the film is referenced in the hit Cindy Lauper song of the same name. So before we go into talking about this, let's cut to the trailer of Time After Time, and we'll be back right after this. The time is 1893, and novelist and inventor H.G. Wells invites you to join him on a flight from London to San Francisco. In under a minute, you will be transported to a bizarre and fantastic new age. Today. Time after time. For H.G. Wells, the modern world offers a spectacular array of revelations, embarrassments, and delights. Well, hello there. Hello. What's up, Doc? I beg your pardon? You were saying, where to? Uh, could you please take me as quickly as possible to the Hyatt? But Wells has not come here as a tourist. His visit will be somewhat more dangerous. For he is pursuing Jack the Ripper, a villain who has eluded his fate by escaping into time. Ninety years ago, I was a freak. Today, I'm an amateur. <laughs> I'm obliged to take you back to face the consequences of your acts. You take me back. How do you propose to do that? By force? Be reasonable, John. We don't belong here. A 19th century gentleman. One. You don't close your eyes. And a 20th century woman. One nearer to you. Join forces to capture a criminal from the past. At large, in the modern world. But even more than they want him, he needs them. You throw me the key, and I'll release the girl. On your honor, John, you have my word as a gentleman. I would have expected that you'd notice by now that I am not a gentleman. Say goodbye. Goodbye, Herbert. You haven't instructed him in the use of one of these machines, have you? H.G. it's checkmate and you've lost again. A romantic adventure, a breathless chase around the world and across a century. Time after time. Welcome back to Literary License Podcast. We're discussing Time After Time, the 1979 film. So, John, what are your thoughts of Time After Time? Um, so, I think I selected this one. I selected it because a friend of mine told me to watch this, and, and I had it on my list for a very long time. And I love time travel movies. And then I realized... How do like, I? Like the time I, machine? And yeah, all it's, it's very yeah. interesting because, like, I've always had a, a weird... H.G. Wells fetish. I don't know what it is. Like, what about H.G. Wells? I mean, stylistically, just like also just how someone was so forward thinking in science and technology. He was absolutely brilliant, though. If you yeah. read any of his articles and stuff, he yeah. like almost like predicted the future, kind of, sort of, you yeah. know? I mean, yeah. he inspired Gene Roddenberry and other just sci-fi uh, I almost authors. wonder if and... he was actually time traveling because he had it so nailed. You never know. You could have. Um, what I thought was interesting about the film is um, McDowell um, was attracted to the the role of um, H.G. Wells, but he wanted something different from trying to break away from Caliglia. Caliglia? <laughs> Caliglia? Oh, God, How do you pronounce man, it? Caliglia? Caliglia. We have to do a whole podcast just on fucking Caligula. <laughs> so... I mean, you can only imagine you do this movie that you think, oh, this is probably a good idea. Oh, shit, I need to do something to wrap this up. I I always think of him as smacking his horse on the ass. (laughs) Or anally, or fisting that guy during his wedding. Oh, my God. (laughs) There you go, folks. We might be covering Caligula someday, if I could ever say it right. Oh, Um, my God. Yeah, but you can't watch the R version. It has to be the X version or you're a wimp. Go big or go home. Watch the real version. Um, He was also saying that, he, he's stated it saying that um, 
he had received a copy of a recording of Wells speaking. And so he wanted to really know the character and he had a squeaky Southeast London accent. So he was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to speak in a more dignified speaking style. (laughs) So I thought that was really funny. Um, and they then, wanted Mick Jagger for the part. Did you yeah, mean, that's what I was going to mention too. Yeah, like, Mick can Jagger. Can you imagine Mick Jagger? Uh, I don't know. It actually, been it would, actually it would, I think it would have ruined the film, actually. <laughs> yeah. There would have been too much presence around his own persona to right. it would have eclipse the character. Probably so. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, time after time for me is time after time when HBO was quite new. To, when it was um, the little brown was, box with the, the little black thing, you just turn yeah. it. Yeah, HBO. and you had to like push the button or what pa- thing you wanted. <laughs> but um, um, but HBO was quite new. And I remember being at my dad, because I used to spend some of the summers with my dad. And time after time was on HBO. And I used I to watch That's when I watched it. And I was, I was kind of obsessed with this film. Not obsessed to the point where I was like, I had to read articles on it. But it was like, every time it was on, I was watching it, you know, sort yeah. of thing. And Same. loved it. And I, until you mentioned it, I kind of forgot about it. Because I haven't seen it since my childhood. But, and to be honest, because I was so young. And the thing is, is you know, now I've, you know, at that time in 79, I would have been 14. So... And loving it. And it's during the summer and I watch it every single time. And I remember, the thing is, I always remember Mary Steenburgen in this because every after this yeah. movie, I always remember her time after time, Mary Steenburgen and time right. after time and I always loved her. But it's only now that I actually realized that Malcolm McDowell, who at that time, I guess being 14 years old, they're not really seen many Malcolm McDowell films, whether it's Caligula or Clockwork or, <laughs> or, or, you know, or <laughs> latter years Halloween, or the Halloween remakes or whatever. I've never, you know, Mal- Malcolm McDowell to me was always this actor who did like really heavy duty, artsy, hard hitting, very on the cusp of acceptability kind of films. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so, and even though I, New, you know, I've known, you know, H.G. Wells in this movie space over and over and over again. It's always, it's always there as, you know, present. It's only now that reason it was actually Malcolm McDowell the yeah. whole time. That's what they say that. And David Warner from Omen Films. The yeah. Guy gets head cut off in the oh, Omen. Oh, I know. I know. And, and he I, actually does a fantastic job as Jack the Ripper. You know, Jack the, John, you know, a.k.a. Yeah. Jack the Ripper. Um, and, and Mary Steinberg. Uh, so she apparently loves time travel films because she was also in Back to the Future. Yes, well, yeah. the reason why she was in that is because the uh, Steven Spielberg loves this film. Oh, how funny. So, so then he that's won. why. And he said that- find out the, the, the one point of the movie, though, where I almost started crying, and I don't cry 79 movies. Anything mm-hmm. predates 1980. You never see me cry. But the way he just begged for her life yeah yeah Please. yeah don't kill her you know well then and then the whole thing when you think she does die because again i this is from the perception of from the, what, because they went three days ahead and yeah, yeah. and then for me months. i thought like oh my god so and then i was like well why wouldn't you just get in the machine and then go back i was like oh maybe that's what he's gonna do and then you realize she isn't dead you're like oh my god that's that was really brilliant and you know, and I'm not a gentleman when he's like, oh, and my gentleman's honor. And, you know, <laughs> you know, this is a film that shouldn't work. Yeah, it, should, paper, yeah, it, it should, shouldn't level. work. It should, yeah, you know, it shouldn't. Yeah. You know, you got, and you got this first in Victoria, you got Jack the Ripper, which has done fantastically well in this film. And then, or, you know, H.G. Wells, who's a real figure, and we're going to bounce him forward in time. And he's going to be chasing after Jack the Ripper, who's actually repeating the murders in modern day. San Francisco, modern day being 1979. Yeah. And Eureka is like, it shouldn't work, but this is film that works on every single level. Yeah. It's, it's a, ma- it's a magical think film. The most, I thought one of the most, the most brilliant parts of the film is where he's showing H.D. Wells the TV. He goes, you don't belong here. You need to go back. And every channel he turns to is some form of violence. Yeah. He goes, and, now, he goes, now, he goes, I would have been a freak back then, but I'm just an amateur here. Yeah. You and know? no, it speaks to like, or, you know, Orwellian sort of theory of socialism and how in his mind, HG was like, the future is going to be so great. Utopia. It's going to be amazing. Utopia. And then he gets there and he's like, what the, <laughs> like, what the hell is, and then he's like, here. what Just war is this again? And she's war like, yeah. <laughs> he's like another war. You had another war. What the, 
how many wars do y'all have? You know? Yeah. Well, I have to then say though, during that passage, it's like you're kind of watching it and the thing is, and the sad thing about it, this film it's is true. Yeah. it's true. This film is almost this film is over 40 years old and yeah. it's still true. And that's yeah. really sad when you think of it in those terms. You're kind of, you're kind of watching it going it equates into our decade and our century because yeah. nothing has changed. We're still a violent, hostile, despicable, destroying the human race never learns. Yeah, we don't. That's the sad thing. It never after all learns. this time. Well, and and he, I think he points out something that's even true to this day is that, it, like Jack the Ripper, it was he you know he realized there's glorification in what he's doing. He that things that are being witnessed on television and, and on you know are things of acts of violence that he knows. Well, okay, I was doing this for a whole other reason, but I could see why other people are now doing it too because it's getting notoriety, right? And so he sees that as well, you know. This is what what people are drawn to, right? And this he acts is- like it's almost like an art form. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? Well, then again, I mean, if you had a new, let's sit there and say that you wanted to do a CNN kind of news station, and all you want to do is mention good news, I bet you no one would watch it. Yeah, that's correct. the sad thing about it, is because we're we're drawn to the macabre, we're drawn to the darkness, we're, we're drawn to the murder, <laughs> and, but we like hearing about it just as long as just as long as we're safe and it doesn't attack yeah. our personal bubble. Fit, yeah. We're fine with it, just yeah. as long as it's happening to someone else. Of course, you know, if you turn it on to yourself, all of a sudden, like now it's a tragedy because it's about me, yeah. sort of thing. Especially I'll never forget like one of my times that we're in. <laughs> one of my writing professors. I'll never forget one of the the conversations she had is, and she said just as every story has to have love in it, it has to have conflict because no one wants to see, you know, Bobby, Mary, Susie, they have a happy life. They have two kids. They have the white picket house. They have a cat and a dog and, you know, they both die together and happy. And and like, no one wants to see that. They want to know if Bob get, you know, cheats on Susie and (laughs) he has an affair. And like, there's always has to be some level of conflict that it keeps the audience engaged. And I was like, Oh my God, that's such a true. My grandmother used to say that you can't, you can't enjoy the mountains unless you're sitting in the Valley. Yeah. Correct. You need, you need the highs and lows. Otherwise if everything was just plateaued, it'd be like, well, it'd be like Shangri-La lost, you know, it'd be like living in, you know, lost horizon in Shangri-La. The problem with, you know, which I hope one day we'll cover that. But like, if you read the book, Shank, um, Lost Horizon, or you do um, watch the film, basically it's like this utopian kind of life that everything is just flat. Yeah. And some of the, some of the characters get sucked into that and they're quite good. And, and the thing is you Utopia can leave any time. boring though, doesn't it? I, I would well, also... That's, that's the problem. That's why one thing people want to leave because it is, you know, the thing is, is like, okay, you can live a very long time, but if your life is just on this plateau with no hops and downs, yeah. what kind of life is that at the same time? I would watch, um, by the way, highly, highly suggest uh, The Good Place, which is on Netflix. And I think uh, they're going to eventually put the last season, but the last season just... How many seasons it, it, are there? I've not even heard it's, of this It's one. four. It's four seasons. Yeah, it's, it's, fin- it's finished now. I it's it's meant it, to be a very one. comedic type show, but the last season gets really deep and it gets into that philosophy of like, well, what is heaven, right? And what is heaven supposed to be? And then you get there and then it's sort of like, but what now? Like what now? What now when you've come to the highest pinnacle of your joy, right? Or your, you know, and when is that enough? Right. And what happens after when it's enough? Like what's what's now next? And it it gets really deep. And I mean, I remember just days sitting in my brain going, wow, that was so deep and so poignant. Because in heaven, they're just all bored. They've done everything they can do. Like you can you can enjoy everything you want in heaven. And they and they've done it but they're there for an eternity. Now they're just bored yeah. because there's nothing more to do. So basically well, you just and have, you, there's you, lethargic oh, people the all in heaven going story? really and you, and you start to forget what joy is, right? So you start yeah. to forget who Keith is. You start to forget who Vicky is, who John is. So there's, there's like a very lethargic thing that happens that it's like, it's like imagine meeting who you think should be in heaven. Let's say, I don't know, Shakespeare or whatever. Imagine meeting Shakespeare and Shakespeare is like, Hey, how, how's it going? Like, and he, he you're like, you're Shakespeare. And it, 
he's forgotten all of the joys that he's ever created because he's been in it for a millennium, right? His his whole existence now is oh, just shit, experiencing joy. You guys are even joys. really dying for me now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they're in in a good place. There's a really great resolve to that, and I won't say what it is. And I think it's it's just I would say watch it. Um, but going obviously going back to the the film that we were talking about. Um, it's interesting. H.G. Wells is utopia. It's, it's interesting to know that time is something that is something that we all wonder or have experiences of what was the past like, what is the future like, and that things do repeat, things do happen over and over and over again. Like and, he and, said, we do not learn our lessons. Yeah. Yeah. No. We really don't. Well, that's why I, I always the said 70s, that. It, it, though. You had Son of Sam, you had the Hillside Strangler. I mean, what was it about the 70s? I mean... Well, they mentioned well, the Zodiac, too, remember? Because they the say, Zodiac oh, Zodiac God, as if we don't have enough Boston party on our hands at the Zodiac. <laughs> I mean, you had well, we did have the, people that emerged that were just killing. Yeah, but I think... But if you notice, the people who were killing were all in their 30s. So they're people that are coming out... They're coming out of these, these I, idealistic 1950s yeah. homes that should have been like you know, leave it to beaver. And these people weren't having a leave it to beaver lifestyle no. you know, sort of thing, yeah. but they had those idealistic ways. And I guess I remember being in Florida and in the sixties kind of knocked things up. They were going to, uh, they were going to, they were fixing to at, at, what do you call it, execute Ted Bundy. And this guy down the street had these things called Bundy burgers. <laughs> he was like, and he Christ. never forgot that. Oh my God. It was God. like the $2 Bundy burger. Oh my God. I just, I don't know why I just thought of that. But I mean, people are just so complacent and so flippant about life, even if it Well, was- you know, and I think what causes complacency and flippant about life at the moment is because I think we're over too much information, basically. Oversaturated, because yeah. We're oversaturated with violence. Not, Desensitized. Not, mm-hmm. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about violence from films and television series, shows or computer games. I'm thinking about you're oversensitized um, from news, yeah. You, know, you know, I mean, yeah. every day you wake up and you turn on your phone and if you're lucky and basically if you learn to block the COVID virus like I've been able to do on my phone, you look at what else is going on and basically boy of 10 gets stabbed by you know, teenage kids, teenage kids and them doing knife crime. You got some father who's decided he's going to kill his kids because he's getting a divorce. And it's like, it's over and over and over. It's the same kind of story. But it's constant over. though. And you're right. There's never anything good on the news. I was telling my husband there, dad goes like, I can't take any more Fox or CNN or MSNBC. It's just like, please, I don't want to hear about the virus anymore. I don't want to hear about any well, of it anymore. It's really, and the thing is you go on, you go on social media sites and it's like, and people. That's all it is too. And it's not, you know, but, you know, if you, if you, even if you get away from COVID and you just go about, you know, and then, but you're also getting all this stuff about this person's been murdered for this and that murder and this murder and this war and this war and this politician and that politician and just goes on and on. And yeah. On. And it, you know, and people, you know, and people just share crap and it just goes over and over and over. 24 hour news, 24 hour news is basically the gloom and doom station. So basically it's just gloom and doom. And even, you know, even after, you know, after lockdown is over with and the world's moved on six months from now, it's still going to be the gloom and doom story. It's going to be some other kind of gloom and doom. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine, it's by the way, in this story? Can you imagine, by the way, in this movie? Because they're like, whoa, where do we go? Let's go to the future. And they're like, it's going to be so much better. <laughs> 2020. Well, like where the change, fuck are we? She's going to change her name to Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that. That was, but did you notice, by the way, the way it ends? And it says, like, she died younger than him and i was like probably because she went somewhere where her immunity really sucked and so she didn't live that long (laughs) well you would think her immunity would be better john no because she's now going to a past where it's actually it's yeah where typhoid isn't been wiped out yet so yeah typhoid mary we have to read we have to do a podcast about typhoid mary there's a story there yeah but like what is it calamity jane's Spread on gonorrhea through the wild west. She did. <laughs> she gave she did. God on his truth. The real calamity Jane. Yeah. So, but um, yeah. I'm gonna have to look that up. I hate it. Okay, so you've ruined heaven for me. We have no future. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and we gave new meaning to um, Doris Day singing, oh, the Westwood stage is coming on up the hill. <laughs> oh, 
A woman's work is never done. <laughs> so, but um, but yeah, I mean, with time at the time, I, I thought what that ending with um Amy that that I love the way that they tied H. G. Wells' his real life wife into it. Yeah, yeah. Is that her, her well, that real was wife? Her real name. That was her real name, and she did, and she did, and the stuff that they say in the film that she did, she did actually come. She was women's liberation. She was part of the women liberation. Yeah, she was one time. of the biggest pains in the ass in the UK. <laughs> so, uh, so I said to her, "Say that was." I thought that was quite clever. Um, but going back into more time after time sort of thing, I like the way that the thing is is that I think the special effects. So they were we're looking at these through you know a modern lens. They don't take normally you can watch an old film and sometimes special effects come on and you're kind of going, Oh dear. Sort of yeah, there's like, This is painful. <laughs> but well, in the, here, the in here it's not. painful. But, they were but here, they weren't painful at all. No, I thought no. they were painful because you could tell it was 1979. But well, I have to just say, though, it doesn't take away from it because there's not a lot of blue screen going on. You have that one segment there where he's going back in time, I mean, yeah. going ahead of time, and that's kind of it. So, and um, so you. So they don't, and then you get it again when they're going back in time, but then they kind of fade away from it. Yeah. Which okay, I th- so did you guys think he went, and went when he pulled the uh, crystal thingy out of the time machine, did he go to infinity and beyond? I mean, was that, did that destroy him? I or? guess it was like the, the thing that's inside, I forget what it's called, is like the compass, right? So if you remove that and you try to trigger the machine, it just, you it just sends you. To huh? where? It sends you to like an infinite point in time. Oblivion. I guess. Oblivion, yeah. I thought that he was left in, you know, like when he's going forward in time and you're looking at all the um the the funky imagery that you were getting across the screen. I thought he was just stuck in that world. Correct. <laughs> like like he's, in stuck, he's stuck in the sphere back and forth. of time. But he yeah. actually won't land anywhere. The thing is, like, they don't really. He he lightly explains the technology, but it doesn't get over. It doesn't get overly complicated and i think you just have to like okay <laughs> like you just you don't you don't sit there and go well what is that thing of a bobby and what is the thing you know the key? why do you need the key exactly that key like you yeah. don't over but then again that. this this film is uh it's not really a time travel film though it has time yeah. travel it's more it's more of a human interest story correct you know because yeah. you got you know basically it's about you know, going after Jack the Ripper, him falling in love. And I have to say, Mary Steenburg is the most adorable thing in the film. Yeah. She is really cute. She's like, can you imagine, you... though, Jack the Ripper being unleashed in a time machine? I mean, yeah. the world would be his oyster. Can you imagine? The, the whole, um, I'm actually surprised he didn't keep the machine. So that's where it's a little weird. Like, why wouldn't you just keep the machine? Because he didn't have the key. No, but he did have the key. Well, no, H.G. Wells had the key, but the, the the time machine would only return if if you possess. Oh, the, if you have the key. key. Oh, I see. So it's so like a, if you had that thing, a one way trip, you just kind of get dumped it, out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that would signify that you're going to be able to stay in that com- compelling time. Um, but going back to, um, uh, I love the scene where she's sitting on the couch and she's like, if you don't, if you don't kiss me right now, I'm going to go crazy. And I'm like, you get it, girl. <laughs> oh my God. I just thought that was so embarrassing. Actually, just like talk about 1979 movie hits. Yeah. You know, just like, because she's supposed to be, well, they act, well, she's talking to her friend in the bank and you think they're like you know, kind of not loose or morally casual women, but obviously they've been out. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, and here you got H.G. Wells, and he's from the Victorian era. He's like, what in the actual fuck is going on? Well, he's meant to be a proper man, you know, treating women properly, and, and she's a pro- progressive woman. Like, you got to go after what you back want. back then, and- women didn't act that way. It's just like, oh, my virgin ears, you know? Yeah, but, you know, the thing is, though... He he did say, but you got to remember the H.G. Wells, and he does mention this about, you know, the guy of free love. He is yeah. the god of free love. He's promoting free love in the Victorian era. Yeah, he's but did he art. actually know what to do with free love back then? You could well, it, no, but, but, he, but, he also, but he's also fighting for women liberations as well. Yeah, H.G. Exactly. Wells, if you look at his history, he's actually one of the forefronters of women liberation. Actually, yeah. making so women could vote. He, he helped push that through. Well, yeah, and I like that part. comment where he and said, so he, I used to be, or did he say I used to be like past tense? And then she's like, yeah. used to be, what happened? And he's like, I yeah. mean, I am, I am. 
<laughs> so what I thought was quite interesting, though, you know, you know, in the face of this forward woman from forward for Victorian times, I think also what kind of makes it kind of work for me is that basically because he actually thought that women can or that women would be able they could do this. Women yeah. can take control of their lives. Women can have a career. This is what he was fighting for in his in his Victorian times. I have to so they ask, actually see it come to for, fruition. But I also like what he said that he asked permission. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have to ask though, just to kick patriarchy's ass, just for my you know friends out there that are into anti-patriarchy, what changed where women did not have rights? Where did this start? That you know we have all this you know From the Bible. Yeah, I was gonna say right. it, women it are, was women always are, they were treated secondary a lot of, in a lot of ways. I mean, you they know, still for, are in some yeah. cultures. Only in Christian mythology, but if you go no, back, no, Muslim, <laughs> yeah. Muslim, Muslim, Jewish, yeah, Jewish, a lot of them. A, you know, um, it's a part. It's part of religion. Women, uh, men, men are the rulers. Gods can thought. Gods thought to be male. You yeah. know, and every almost every single religion is the male god sort of thing if there is a female god it's because she's bitter about something um and basically you know women don't have rights they're there to give birth carry on the man's name yeah um women are not br- you know they, they're not bright because they, they don't need to be bright because all they need to do is be pregnant yeah and take care and, and, and take, sir, care, and of take me. care of the kids and take care of the parents and yeah, yeah i mean yeah. take care of the husband yeah mm-hmm. you know and i think you know, and it's been like that all the way through history. Okay, yeah, you do get pockets where women have, you know, break and free or or, or you get like a strong woman who's fought against convention, but they're rare. Yeah. You know, I mean, now, I mean, things are different nowadays. I mean, I mean, after the 60s and stuff like this, like, but even <clears> 60s, <throat> I mean, you know, women weren't, you know, if there was a man going for the same job as a woman, the man got the job, the woman, it wasn't your right to have that job. Yeah. yeah, that was that was as far as sixties. That was only fifty years ago. Yeah, yeah. you know, and it's like nineteen twenty. Isn't that far ago either? You know, where you get the right to vote. I can't even imagine yeah. not having the right to vote. I would. Well, let's. You know, you want to vote. think of that. Look at. Um, it's only been since the sixties that blacks were allowed to vote. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, we sort still of have not learned our lessons. Well, I we, think we have. We're evolving. It's just. It's just. We're takes evolving time. at a real <laughs> slow pace. It's hard well, to, I think, hard I think to we're remove a lot biases better. that are in place, you know, and biases think, are where the problem are. I mean, to be honest, I, th- I think we're, I think we're involved quite overall, most of society in Western countries, I know, are totally happy with, you know, women being equal, women having, you know, getting equal pay for, you know. I just don't understand thing. what the big I think, you know, I think, I think, equal. you know, they're, they're not racist. I think they believe that everyone's created equal. And I do believe that, you know, you know, gays are created equal, but you're always going to have a pocket of society that doesn't believe those things. And yeah. unfortunately, I think they're the minority. And as soon as you start giving voice to that minority, thinking that they're the majority, that's the problem we have today. Correct. People will yeah. think that these stupid people basically are the ones that are, they're, they're the majority, but they're not the majority. <laughs> Majority. Yeah, I yeah. have yet to I have yet to meet someone who's actually against women's rights. I have yet actually got go I've yet to meet someone, and I, I see a lot of patients. You know, yeah, you know, I I have five thousand patients that I see a year, sort of thing, and I have yet to meet anyone who's against gay rights. I've yet to meet someone who's a racist, and I've yet to meet anything. Okay, there's play, there's kind of stuff that you have like generalizations and stereotypes, but I don't think that's true racism or true hatred i think that's just generalization and take that for what it is yeah but they're you know so these things that you're reading are just minorities these are to keep you hatred just to keep your just keep your hatred going so that way you can have this imaginary fight against these people yeah well, they're I very hope hard in between warm at night. i think it's i think what it is is also people need to spend more time being who they are improving who they are not worrying about changing someone because the change Precisely. of someone only comes by the actions of another right so if you Precisely. are gen- genuinely a good person and you want good for everyone just be it don't worry about everyone else trying to be it but if someone wants to lead and learn from that example they'll learn and they'll change right and i've had it from my own experience is the same thing you know oh, it's it's just agree. how society is you know it's a journey That's well i mean i do it this way okay someone if someone doesn't accept me for who i am i'm okay with that that's not my problem that's their yeah. problem i'm Correct. gonna be nice to them and i'm gonna you know I'll, I'll respect them i mean i'll be courteous to them you know i'm not gonna spend a lot of time slagging them, slagging them off because i got more important things to do in my life and and if they and you know nine times out of ten over a course of time they tend to change their opinion of me 
Yeah. But, but, I, but then again, I'm not going to let their opinion change me. I mean, that's fine. If they, and the thing is, people, people have opinions because of lots of different reasons. It's society, it's their upbringing, it could be religion, it could be et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to be honest, if they don't, let's say they don't like gays for whatever reason, they have every right to believe that way if they want yeah. to. And by the way, I'm there's so many shades. Them. There's so many shades of what something is, right? So, yeah. again, hold people accountable for who they are as a person, so, right? So. Stop. I mean, the buckets that we put people in. There's so many shades of people who are black. There's so many shades of people who are who are women or mm-hmm. men who are gay who are straight, yeah. right? So it's hard to pinpoint why someone doesn't like one thing, right? I don't like a guy because of this reason. Well, I mean that's one guy or that's one experience of a man or masculinity. Right. So you kind of have to like realize, just judge people for who they are. If they're, if they're an asshole, they're not, you know, pardon my French, they're an asshole, they're an asshole. (laughs) My grandmother always said, don't judge a man until you walked a mile in their shoes. Yep. Yeah. So so, so, so let's say that, let's say this person has a hatred over whatever he has a hatred over the color green for whatever reasons. I don't know why he has a hatred for that, but maybe there's an okay reason for it. Yeah. Maybe, you know, but then if I like nothing but wearing green, then maybe it's my job just to cre- treat him with a bit of respect and be a bit kind. Because if I do that, then maybe he'll see that the color green's not as bad as he thinks it is. Um, and, you would, which you, which I'm, I'm going to get a lot further than he said they're going, you need to accept this. You need to do this. You need to do that. Da, yeah. da, 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 and pointing my finger at him because I'm, I'm, you know, to be honest, if you're having a conversation with me and as soon as you point a finger at me, I stop listening. Yeah, everyone, you know, anyone shuts <laughs> down, like, anyone would, I, you just shut down. I think yeah, what's you got nothing. Going, yeah. going back to this, like going back to even just the killer, you know, Jack the Ripper. And this is a very different yeah. tale. There's something happening where it's a woman and I can't tell if it's someone who broke his heart. If it was his mother, it never really says what it is, but like the motivation behind women. Well, no, but there was a motivation behind the anger or the hatred, but then there's something that it's reminiscent because he clicks the little, the little watch and the picture pops up and it's, it's almost as if he's nodding. Yeah, but they don't ever say who that is. No, that's what's very interesting about it. But if you look at the style of the, the thingy, she didn't look Victorian. She looked like, because from an earlier age, that woman, the picture. Yeah. I mean, so I'm guessing maybe, maybe it was his mother. But I'm, I'm guessing here. There's nothing that is in this movie. I thought maybe it's maybe because normally women issues normally tend to from to be a mother. Yeah, yeah. Like Actually, Norman Bates. Maybe the two men. Guy I mean, Ripper. seriously, do 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 men really get serious mommy issues from abuse? Well, yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's a Ed, really Ed, Ed Kemper did. He was a serial killer. He had mother issues. Um, John Wayne Gacy had mother issues. Um, Je- Jeffrey Dahmer had mother issues. Um, Charles Manson's had mother issues. Um, Je- Ted Bundy had real mother issues. So, I mean, there's tends there tends to be these. But then again, I guess if you're, I mean, you know, outside of Jeffrey Dahmer and. Right. Um, and they they were after young men, so I think I think they were more or less killing the the thing that they didn't like. They didn't so like the homosexuality like inside themselves. They were killing the homosexuality as an outwardly. I, I think it. I think it's also what society places on the roles of women, right? So if if a woman is supposed to be the the pinnacle of nurturing and caring, right, and she doesn't live up to that, like a child is at a very young age told the the father is a provider, the mother is a nurturing and caring person. Well, if the mother's beating the crap out of you or treating you, your your views of nurturing have changed, have suddenly drastically changed against what society is telling that yeah. to be for you, right? So and if something at- happens, your mother is not the Betty Crocker type yeah. thing. Let's say, there's a, let's say that she's a single mother and the only way she can support herself is maybe through alternative means. Yeah. That and uh, and meanwhile, everyone else you know has like the perfect. Because let's be honest, everyone has it. Uh, look, I saw it. Look that, that this is this is a perfect family. This is the perfect yeah. family because no yeah. one knows what goes behind anyone's closed doors. Right. Yeah. So basically, and everyone thinks so. Everyone's judging everyone on a perception of what th- these other people's lives are. But and as you know, that whether you watch crime, the crime, con- just, um, the crime stations, or the um, various other documentaries on 
crime, you realize that, you know, when you scratch the surface, which David, you know, David Lynch does so fantastically well in the movie Blue Velvet, that, right. you know, it's like, you know, it starts off being really highly, but then when you scratch the surface, it's quite dark and harrowing inside a, a, a regular person's family. There are a yeah. lot of stuff that goes on behind closed doors. That yeah. was a messed up movie. I mean, I love it, but that had to be one of the most messed up movies I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just goes to show you, though, you people try to hold themselves up to what they think reality is. And what yeah. ends up happening is their brain begins to fracture when they realize reality doesn't fit the version that's going on in their head. Like yeah. whatever's happening in the room is not fitting what's happening in their head. So they start to break. And that's what happens. I guess what I, I, I was know. thinking, like you got Jack the Ripper and you got Ed Gain and you got all these people. I'm just trying to figure out why it's different for males because you don't see that many female serial killers. Well, females do things a bit differently. They might not be killing that that female aspect that they're that um, that has been ruined to them by whatever mother fixations they have. But what you will do is um, women work just slightly different. But what they do is they go through a different kind of cycle where they're not killing someone, but they're actually kind of killing themselves with daddy issues yeah. and finding them. Themselves, um, trying to look for the perfect man kind of scenario. So if their father is very abusive, then what, what they'll tend to do is they'll tend to go into this merry-go-round where they start going after these abusive men over and over and over yeah. again with domestic violence and you know, seems to perpetrate with the men that they seem to attract. So they kind of do it that way where men kind of do it. I, men kind of do it differently that they'll like, if they've been abused, they'll either cause abuse they tend to cause abuse for women. If they've gotten abuse, they tend to accept, they tend to take the abuse. Yeah. And it's, it's just kind of weird just position. But then again, you know, you got to remember that your mother and father, uh, you know, you see, you know, this is what your vision of what your future is supposed to be. And this is supposed to be the key, the key role models in your life. Yeah. And these, and, and because they're with you 24 seven or mostly 24 seven, that they are actually forming your emotional being and who you're going to be. And so if this is what's being, you know, whatever they're perpetrating over and over and over in you is actually forming your, psych you know, your psychiatric being. And this is, this is how you're going to be. Now, once you get to your teenage, years or normally for 10 and 10, 10 14 depending on what your mental maturity is two one or two things happens you either become exactly like your parents or become a, a facet of your parents personality or you do a 180 and you totally rebel against your parents yeah so it's and there's always one or the other there's not there's never this even even little kind of kind of thing middle ground it's one or the other right and mm -hmm. you know sort of thing so it's all about you know it's family you know it's family psychiatry basically and how you and your version of what a family is is by what's been presented to you and how you re reenact for that so and so for jack the ripper i mean the thing is if it is a mother issues and it's killing women it's i don't think it's a girlfriend i don't think of i don't that's the reason why i don't think it's ever a girlfriend that would create you to sit there and want to go and murder women it's normally going to be yeah. because your mother because it's the what you think that your mother should be and then you're kind of killing that aspect because this is what she wasn't so you're kind of killing the aspect that you wish she was being so because if you think that your mother was a prostitute then you tend to kill prostitutes because mm -hmm. You know, the, your mother became one. It's not that you're kind of killing the the. You're kind of killing your mother over and over and over again because you yeah. wish she was something different. Yeah, you're trying to change her her vision of what she is. Yeah. You know? You know, like, you know, I guess, I guess you could say the same thing. I guess that you probably could become a serial killer if you have a non-existent mother, if your mother's working all the time and maybe you go after business women or something, you know, it'd work, yeah. it'd work on the same kind of um, scenario sort of thing, which is kind of interesting that we got from a science fiction time after time so murder but yeah. I, mean, I think that's we what always we, just kind I think of spray that's what we do, though we kind yeah. of like go down a dark path sometimes but i mean it still goes to it, it's a figure right a figure that is still to this day i mean i'm sure 20 30 40 years from now will be a figure that people will always try to still elusive still yeah, to, still elusive trying to figure out who jack the ripper was and what what mystery i mean in both cases in both films i would say it was very interesting was one could say that his body fell into the water and what if it washed away and no one knew really anything if that was him right because like as Keith said in the first film like 
Could be copycat. Kevin. It could have been a copycat. It could have been someone else. And the same thing with, with we'll this. never know. But with, isn't um, it one of life's biggest mysteries, though? It's like, who was Jack the Ripper? Yeah. I mean, don't you? Yeah. I mean, I don't like lay in bed worrying about it all night long. But I mean, when you start thinking about it and you get on topics like this, you really, was was he Prince Albert or, you know, what yeah. was the deal? You know? Yeah. And I think, I think also you also have... I think the Jack Ripper case, you also have someone who's actually writing letters to the press as well. So I think I think that's probably the first time a serial killer was like coning him. And the question is, were the letters were the letters from Jack the Ripper or were they yeah. from someone else perpetrating it? Yeah. Because later Trying on we claim had claim notoriety. Well, we had a thing here from called the Yorkshire Ripper over here. Mm-hmm. And letters are being written to the press and people thought that was the Yorkshire Ripper and come to find out it actually wasn't the Yorkshire Ripper. They found the person who's oh, actually writing. Oh, it wasn't. It. No, no. no. Mm-mm. So and 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 then same thing with the Zodiac killer. Isn't the Zodiac killer all about the letters that we're getting through? But was were the was it the Zodiac killer? But the letters or was it were ingenious, the though. If you want to look at some of the letters, have you looked at the letters? Mm-hmm. You know, in in the books. Yeah. You know, I mean, th- th- it required a lot of thought. Well, I mean, it was a game. It was a puzzle for that person to kind of put the detectives through it, and was you know one of these things where. You, if you wanted to be caught, you'd be like, look, I'm so-and-so, this is who I am, and I want notoriety, but it was a game to that killer, right? And, and trying to play with the detective's minds. Yeah. Crazy. So I think what we're going to do now is go into our epilogue, and we'll start our final thoughts. So, Vicky, what are your final thoughts of The Lodger and Time After Time? Love both movies. Definitely think it's a must-see for everybody that historically, or even if, even if you're just one of those people that likes the, the whodunit, or if you're interested in historical serial killers, they're, they're both actually well done. And I mean, I, I could sit there, like, you know how you flick through TV when you know, you're not watching Amazon or Netflix, like in, in the day, but if, if it's a Sunday and you see this movie come on, I'll watch it every time yeah just because i think it's great and i i really do think that these are probably two of the best films i've seen and what about yourself john uh i agree they run um very different in theme and style um but they still like i said they focus on jack the ripper and how he will be this infamous historical figure that everyone will want to kind of know who they are who he is We'll never know. Well, you never know. Like forensics is always developing. Who knows? Um, but I definitely loved each film independently. And um, I, I want to now go back and check out the uh, Alfred. 1927 Hitchcock. version. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. I I'm going to go back and check that out. For me, I have to just say out of all our two for ones, these two films actually complement each other. Probably the best sort of thing. They're very, very um, even and stuff like this. And I have to just say, I love both films. I, the Jack the Ripper, that's the thing. I mean, you know, 25 books, 25 to 30 books a year get written about Jack the Ripper and get released every single year. And exactly. documentaries keep coming and coming. So that's always quite fascinating. But I love, you know, I love the H.G. Wells, which for our listeners out there, well, we'll be covering H.G. Wells, The Time Machine in season four. So um, I know, but- I can't wait for that one. I love it. So, but um, yeah, I have to there say that, yeah, both these films, I watched one after the other, and I have to there say I've never found two films that are so different, but are such a good companion piece with each other. I exactly. recommend. This can be a cutthroat kind of world, and we often wonder what things might have been like if we had lived in a different time. Would things be better, or sadly, would they be worse? Though times seem dark right now, we at the Literary License Podcast will always try to apply a little bit of levity to lighten up things. And if you're in the mood to take a trip in time, head on over to our website at llpodcast.com to listen to all of our past episodes, become a patron, and sign up for our monthly newsletter to read our reviews of books to screens and everything in between. And if you want to see what the future holds, for our next episode, we'll be continuing our theme of the month, Elementary, My Dear, with the 1975 film Profondo Rosso, a.k.a. Deep Red. Hey, you did that good. Thank you. Time and time again, we thank you for downloading, <laughs> liking, and sharing the Literary License Podcast. We had a ripping good time, and we hope you have too. Bye, folks. Bye. Bye, everybody. Take care of yourselves.